Hello everyone, thank you for joining us today. In, in this snowy afternoon, at least that's how it is here in Ohio. Uh, I will not introduce myself too much. I am the president of Multicase. I've been with the company since year 2000. We were doing a lot of projects and uh, participated in a couple of webinars. So I might be familiar to some of you. We are going to be talking about pre predictive toxicology using QSRs, the most effective use of various toxicity endpoints models. And as Jana mentioned, there are going to be several speakers here. So I'm just doing the introductory part. And Dr. Suman Chakravarty and Monica Giriredi will be providing some interesting um, review of um, different modeling techniques. And uh, Monica will provide a review of one of our model bundles and endocrine disruptors. Topics which will be covered. It's a little bit of history. What kind of history Multicase has with QSR models? And then we will go through various way of making predictions using databases, using read across, um, using statistical or rule-based models, um, pretty much going a little bit into details, finding out what are these models, are they different, are they maybe they're not so different, touching base on deep learning models. Uh, we will mention the endpoints which we'll cover, and as I mentioned, endocrine models will be explored a little bit in depth. So the history of QSR models with Multicase starts with 1984, when Multicase was not even established yet. It started with research paper of Professor Dr. Uh, Professor Gilles Klopman, who is also founder of Multicase Incorporated, and he published the paper Artificial Intelligence Approach to Structure Activity Studies. Um, computer automated structure evaluation of biological activities of organic molecules. The, the paper was published published in JAX, and uh, it's extremely heavily referenced. I believe it's like more than a couple of hundred references by this day. And the models which were presented in this paper were carcinogenicity models for specific classes of chemicals of polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons for and nitrosamines and for pesticidal of some of uh, activity of some of ketoxim carbamates. Well, since uh, 1984, majority of the models which we were dealing with were st classical statistical models. It's changed slightly after ICHM7 guidance was introduced. From that moment, we started to use also rule-based models. So as of now, we cover both types of modeling and um, Models endpoints which we cover, or toxicity categories which we cover with all these models are listed here. As you can see, it's uh, pretty much a very wide coverage for all endpoints of interest. Some of them are already regularly accepted. Some of them are recommended to use as accessories in uh, at least in regulatory preparations. And uh, all of them are used by our partners, in, not, by our RCA partners as uh, CEDAR, Office of USFDA, CFSAN. Uh, Office of Tobacco and Office of Veterinary Medicine. So all of them are recognized by uh, regulatory authorities. Um, now it would be my honor to, to present to you next speaker, who is uh, Dr. Suman Chakravarty, Vice President and Chief Scientific Officer. He will speak more about modeling techniques which we use. Uh, I will not go much through the uh, Suman's resume here. Um, first, you can read it from the screen. Second. He was a um, driving force behind many of the webinars which were already um, performed, and I'm sure he is very familiar to many of the attendants. Um, with this, I'm passing the floor to Dr. Chakravarty. Um, hello, everybody, and thanks, uh, Rusam, for the kind introduction. And I welcome everybody to uh, for this webinar and thanks for joining the webinar. Um, my intention today is to to show or to establish the importance of modeling and what kind of role it plays in uh, in prediction of biological activities of uh, different molecules. So uh, what I want to do is to to show you a, a stepwise process where I would gradually take uh, steps to find out or to show you 
uh, when we can graduate from simple searching to making predictions and where uh, the modeling comes into play and what happens if we do not include modeling in our uh, process. So if we exclude it from the workflow, uh, then we probably would be able to know more uh, about its, its importance um, in uh, uh, the prediction of activity of new chemicals. So with that, let's start. Um, so uh, anything that we do starts with a database. And this database is a specific type of database, which is structure and activity. So it's a it's simply a compilation of uh, chemical structures and their experimentally observed or measured activity. So that is the basis of of the database. And uh, you know, being a database, any any time you want to make a search, you can make different types of search in the database. So it's a searchable compilation compilation of uh, chemical structures and their experimentally observed activity. So uh, you know, I just made small sketches for every one of these slides and uh, in this in this uh, particular uh, illustration I'm, i want to show a basic representation of a database where you have structures and then you have a, a list of uh, every molecules either pr some property or biological activity and the properties can be of different types we can have binary uh, properties where we only uh, show if the chemical is positive or negative in a particular assay uh, in this case, the red dots are positive outcomes and green dots are negative outcome. They could be any kind of toxicity like mutagenicity or carcinogenicity. So which we can easily express in terms of uh, two labels, two different types of labels. Or it can be of multi-class. So we can have, say, skin sensitization where we have uh, strong sensitizer, moderately strong sensitizer or weak sensitizer. So we can we can categorize them in terms of multi uh, label you know different types of uh, labels. So that's a multi class, or we can also have a uh, you can we can also represent the properties or activities in terms of continuous values, um, which can take any magnitude or any value uh, possible. And so one of the examples is the LD50 uh, of uh, chemicals. So this is how a basic database looks like you know, in a very simplified manner. You know, of course, the database has many other complex features uh, to enable complicated search and, you know, it can be more sophisticated in, in its nature, but this is a simply a representation of a, a structure activity database, which is the beginning of uh, everything that we do. So first thing that we can do with a database is to search it uh, and search it for a chemical uh, to know what is already known about it a query chemical uh, in terms of a particular type of property or activity. So what is already known about the chemical and for that we can make a database search. So for example, suppose we have this query, which is ibuprofen molecule, and we want to find out if this uh, molecule is going to be carcin is, is already a known carcinogen or not. So we have a carcinogen database uh, and we can make a search in it to find out if this chemical is carcinogenic or not. And the answer is no, it's not a carcinogen. And the, the thing is that we can only find the answer if this chemical is present in the database or not, exactly as it is, you know. So uh, in order to get any kind of interesting finding, we need to have this chemical present in the database. If not, then it can fail and it can fail to give any results. So that is the problem with database search, but Nonetheless, it's extremely important to start with a database search to know what is already known about this chemical. The second best thing that we can do when, the, when we do not find a chemical in our uh, structure activity database is to use surrogate endpoint database. Uh, now the surrogate endpoints are uh, those that are used when the original endpoint is not adequate or, or Unavail unavailable. So for, for example, if you do not find the, your query chemical in the uh, desired endpoint database, then it's not adequate because you are not going to get any answers. So in that case, or suppose if you uh, trying to find uh, carcinogens or human carcinogens of a chemical, you may not find any database that, that have uh, human carcinogenicity 
uh, measured and stored. You know, you can get some examples, but you are not going to get a, a very robust database for that type of activity. So in that case, we got to use uh, surrogate endpoints. So let's start with uh, an example, acetazolamide. And suppose we try to find its carcinogenicity in, you know, just take as example, rodent carcinogenicity. And if we search in the carcinogenicity database that we have, you may not find any values. That means this chemical is not present in the database. So the best, next best thing that we can do is search it in Ames mutagenesis database, which is much bigger. And in this particular case, we found the answer that this chemical, acetazolamide, is non-mutagenic in Ames test. So at least we got some replacement, uh, you know, uh, when we do not have any information regarding carcinogenicities available for this chemical. So this is the role of using uh, surrogate endpoints. Um, but these are still approximation and we might still fail to get any results. So suppose in this case, acetazolamide, if it is not present in our AMS mutagency database, we are not gonna get any results. So that's another dead end that we might hit. So next step is to modify the search to find similar compounds. So this is a activity where we are trying to use the concepts of chemical similarity and in order to get some idea about um, similar compounds uh, that that might have and with an assumption that similar compounds can have similar type of biological activity so that's the next step so let's start with ibuprofen again and uh, if we search it in uh, say for example in case of uh, mutagenicity we might want to uh, perform a similarity search in mutagenicity database and if we do that then even if ibuprofen is not present in the database, we might still get some chemicals that are similar uh, to the query chemical and uh, obviously we'll get their experimental activity. And in this case, all these three chemicals are non-mutagenic. But as you can see, the similarity values of these three uh, similar compounds are very high. They are about 0.5. So the, the value of these uh, these analogs are questionable uh, and uh, we may not get a satisfactory result. But the, the thing that is remarkable in this case is that now we start, start getting a prediction, you know, which is which, uh, the replacement of not having the chemical present in the database. So in this case, if we uh, just take the closest chemicals, um, chemicals uh, experimental values, then this chemical is non-mutagenic but the confidence is only 0.52, which is the average of those three similarity values. So this is simply, I just cooked up this te technique of predicting uh, the activity of a chemical, even if it is not present in the database. So this is something very important that happened right now. You know, So this is our first step towards prediction. So the similarity searches are very useful. They are fast, simple, uh, but, the results need uh, inspection by an expert to find out if these analogs are really valid or not. And you might still fail to get any result because uh, in the case when uh, the analogs are of limited value, uh, if they are very, they have low similarity with the query compound. In that case, the result may not have any kind of value. So we can still fail. So. But still, it is the first step towards prediction and very, very highly useful. We also call it as a read, read across. Uh, it's, a, it's a rudimentary version of read across that we can do. Now, let's modify our question. Instead of searching to find out if we know anything about the chemical uh, by searching it into the database, we can modify our question to ask if we know anything about parts of chemical structure, you know? So uh, that is what I call fragment search. That means instead of searching the whole molecule, we are now trying to search individual or portions of molecules to find out if we know anything about them or we, if we can compute the, uh, the potential of biological activity by individual structural features of the chemical. So uh, in this case, I took another example, chloramphenicol, which is a known drug. And instead of searching the whole molecule as it is, I divided 
uh, the molecule into four fragments, you know, and how many fragments you can get or, and, and what type of fragments you can get, that can be decided by a simple decision process, you know, you, do you want to have linear fragments or atom-centered fragments or wh whatever uh, that you want to do. But the, the thing is that you don't, do not need any specific knowledge or mechanistic knowledge to get these fragments. You just divide the molecule into different fragments and then uh, we can search them into a database. In this case, I'm searching them, each one of them into our mutagenesis database. And these are the results that I got. And as you can see that uh, the first fragment, which is a dichloride type of fragment, it is present in 27 positives and one negative. Uh, that means uh, it, is it is 27 molecules that contain this particular fragment are mutagenic and only one of its non-mutagenic. So the probability that a molecule can have this, this fragment uh, and be positive is 96%. So it's a very high probability fragment. Same thing goes with the aromatic nitro group, 86%. But this secondary amine group, which is present here, it's a part of the amide functionality. It's only present in 16% positives. But this particular fragment is also highly um, relevant, 86%. So now we are computing the potential of individual parts of molecule to be biologically relevant or not, you know, and we can Again, combine the, uh, the potential of activity of each part of the molecule to get a final prediction. And in this case, I just took the highest uh, probable uh, fragment and added it to the confidence value and the final prediction is mutagenic. So we are now doing something more advanced. Uh, it, lo it looks very simple, but actually it's a very advanced co concept and very highly effective concept of predicting something. The highlights of this type of fragment search is that it's completely computational. We do not need any kind of uh, expert knowledge of the mechanistic um, information about these fragments. We just compute them by simply using the, uh, the molecular structure and search them into the database. So that's the only thing that we do. So it, it is a completely data-driven uh, information. We do not need any mechanistic information, but the problem is you can have a fragment from a molecule that may not present in a single mm -hmm. chemical in, your, in the database. So those are called uncovered features and that might lead in, in a out of domain type of outcome. And at the end, you might still need the inspection of these fragments to determine their uh, mechanistic validity by an expert, you know. So this is, this is the highlights of the fragment search and we are graduated to a more advanced way to make predictions. Now, this is a data-driven technique. What happens if we, instead of searching the fragment that we generate from the molecule, we check into a uh, structure alert knowledge base. So those structure alerts are, are compiled by an expert or multiple experts. And in this case, we are just making search of the query chemical into a dictionary of expert knowledge structural alerts. And let's see what happens. We take the same chemical, chloramphenicol, and uh, we make a search into the expert knowledge mutagenic alerts, and let's see what we find. So we found two alerts, nitroaromatic alert and aliphatic halide, uh, as uh, in, the, in the previous case. And since these alerts are already filtered, compiled, and uh, evaluated by, by a human expert, we already know that these alerts or these structural features has something to do with the mutagenicity. So we can stop right here and we can declare this chemical to be, um, to be mm -hmm. mutagenic just based on the presence of the um, expert alerts. Uh, and you will be actually right uh, a lot of times. So this is a valid way to make predictions simply by scanning through a database of expert structural alerts. But in addition, we can do another step that we did with the uh, statistical or, or the fragments before that we can search these expert uh, structural alerts into our database and we can get the same type of you know ratios of positive and negative chemicals that contain this alert 
Uh, and in the case, as you see, the natural aromatic is present in 86% of the chemicals and the aliphatic halides are present in 72% of the chemicals. So the final prediction is, um, sorry, uh, the, the final prediction is that it's mutagenic and confidence is 86%. So the highlights is that it, it can be operated with without any molecular data set. If we stop here at this stage, then we do not, we are not using any database, but still we can get uh, the prediction. Uh, and the biggest advantage is that we know the mechanistic basis of the alerts. Okay, so this is the highlight of the expert knowledge based system prediction. So overall, if you see all the things that we have done, counting the fragments is the key for making prediction. Simple count, nothing advanced, because the counts actually give probabilities. So for example, whatever we you have seen those numbers, probability of a molecule to be positive if a fragment is present. And that's exactly what we did with the nitro aromatic uh, molecule, uh, fragment that is present in 1480 molecules that are positive and 245 molecules that are negative. And we can simply divide the two values and we can get a probability. And it's simple arithmetic, you know, it has nothing to do with actually statistics. We just call it statistic to, to sound more sophisticated. But actually, as you can see, it's a simple uh, count and arithmetic. And we can we can compute different types of probabilities, including what is the probability of a molecule to be negative if the chemical is present, and so on and so forth. And believe it or not, this is everything that you need to do to to perform a prediction using naive Bayes methodology. If you can compute these four uh, probabilities, you are good to go with naive Bayes uh, methodology, and you can make a prediction. So. Uh, the probabilities of different fragments can be combined in different ways to make prediction for the whole molecule. And, you know, this is simply by using counting as I, as I mentioned uh, just now. So it's a very powerful way to make predictions. So we can do a lot by just simply searching fragments into databases. We can, we can find out if the chemical is uh, known uh, and what we know about its biological activity. We can make a prediction by qualitative and quantitative manner we can uh, we can perform both statistical and or data driven uh, predictions or we can also do expert knowledge based predictions we can even identify structural alerts so the question comes in then what is modeling this is simple search you know and why do we even need it and the answer is that actually you do not need uh, modeling to make predictions um, you can do everything just by simple searching, but if we use modeling, sometimes you can do a lot better if you do modeling. So let's now find out what exactly we mean by modeling, you know, uh, since it looks like that we can do everything without modeling. So let's first overview what are the flaws of the simple search based, based methods that I just showed uh, in my previous slides. So the first biggest uh, flaw is that we never verify the accuracy of the predictions by cross-checking with the experimental activity of the uh, database uh, uh, molecules. So that is the flaw. So we do not know uh, how, how good we are doing. So that is the biggest flaw of, of this kind of methodology. You know, We never verified the final prediction with the actual experimental values. Second thing is that we have done a lot of repeated and unnecessary searches. So every molecule is treated new. And you know if you search for a fragment in the first molecule and the second molecule also contains the same fragment, you are gonna do the same search. And the searches are really slow. It takes time to perform uh, fragment search in, in databases. So it can become really impractical. And the biggest thing that we are not, uh, that we are not learning anything, we are not learning from uh, predictions from different chemicals. We are just going uh, as we find things and we are just marching ahead without learning anything. So every query chemical is treated as a new one. Uh, and lastly, so we, we are not doing any kind of sophisticated pattern recognition by evaluating groups of chemicals that might share some uh, alerts and the alerts are overlapped with each other. So we are not doing any kind of sophisticated pattern recognition. So that's why 
the accuracy of the pattern search based techniques are sometimes uh, lower uh, than what we can actually get. So let's now define modeling. So model nothing but optimization of the prediction technique to reproduce the experimental data as accurately as possible. So as you can see from the definition itself, and you know, I just made up the definition myself. Uh, that is, you know, it's just simply performing the prediction over and over again and trying to tweak it so that we can get better reproduction of the experimental data, you know, and that's where the training data, training chemicals comes in. So modeling actually involves training chemicals and training chemicals, chemicals are nothing but the database that I just showed you. We can use them as the query chemicals. And the modeling technique is an iterative prediction, iterative process of performing the prediction, checking out how good we are doing and modifying it to make it better. And the tweaking can have different steps in it. It can, it can involve exclusion of some fragments that are not related to activity. So if some fragments are not really relevant to activity, why to search them over and over again? So that's basically what we call feature selection, you know, in a, in a different way. Uh, we can also combine different fragments and features to get new alerts or new features. That's some, sometimes called feature engineering or, or modification of the expert rules or alerts, you know, and, and deep learning and neural networks are nothing but actually a sophisticated way of doing um, finding new features and combination of uh, different features. So that's what is, uh, uh, you know, the modeling actually people refer to. We can also compute quantitative importance of fragments. And that's nothing but performing regression. When you, when you perform a regression, you can compute uh, the quantitative values of every fragment. And uh, that's what is, uh, you know, the, the weights of every fragment can be computed. We can also perform modeling simply by modifying the training set manually and going back again to perform the prediction step. So that's, these, these are some of the things that I think makes modeling what it, it is about all about. So let's now see it in a simple uh, workflow fashion. So we start with the training chemicals. We uh, build a fragment library. So every, every chemical of the training set is broken down into fragments and surged into the library so that it doesn't have to be done over and over again, you know. So in, that actually reduces the, uh, the time tremendously. Then using the basic uh, searching technique that I just showed you, we can predict the activity of the training set chemicals. So that's, that's something that we have done in simple search based technique. Uh, as I mentioned before, in addition, we can search the expert knowledge base and find, predict the activity of the training set chemicals. Then we can check the accuracy of the prediction. And you can check the accuracy of the prediction by computing R square, root mean square error, standard deviation, sensitivity specificity, or you can visually inspect the alerts if they make any sense or not. You know, so that's the checking of the accuracy of the predictions. And then we ask a question, is the accuracy satisfactory enough? If it is yes, then we are done. We can we can get the model and use it for future prediction of new chemicals that are not present in the training set. But what happens if we, if the, the, the accuracy is not satisfactory? And that's where we tweak or optimize the prediction method by doing feature selection, by fitting with the uh, experimental data by regression or random forest or deep learning. Or we can modify the expert, if we are using an expert rule-based system, we can modify the expert alerts, we can modify the training set. So then we immediately go back to these areas, you know, and start doing the same thing over again. We, we, can, we can perform this loop a few times until the accuracy is satisfactory. The moment it's done, we stop. Sometimes we find new data. And when we find new data, we add it to the training chemical and do the whole process again to see if we can get a better model or not. So that's what modeling is all about, you know. Uh, and as you can see, that the expert rule-based system and the statistical system are not really, uh, they have a lot of common things, you know, 
the source of the alerts are different, but overall they are very same. And also it shows you that the prediction process and the training process, they have a lot of common steps, uh, uh, you know, from a computational point of view. So with that, I finish. And thank you very much for paying attention. Next speaker is my colleague, Monica Giri Reddy, and she's gonna talk about uh, different models we have, and uh, she's going to present specifically the endocrine disruptor or endocrine disruptor binding uh, models that we have prepared. So with that, I give, uh, give it to Monica. Thank you very much. Hi everyone, this is Monica. As Rustam mentioned in the beginning of the webinar, we have multiple models available in Pace Ultra, like bacterial mutagenicity, genotoxicity, hepatotoxicity, carcinogenicity, endocrine models, adverse effect models, etc. Today, in our session, we'll be concentrating on endocrine models within Pace Ultra. We all know that endocrine system is important because it coordinates and regulates many essential body functions like growth and maturation, behavior, reproduction, etc. Endocrine disrupting chemicals are substances in food environment which interfere with the body's endocrine system and cause various developmental, reproductive, and neurological effects. A substance is called endocrine disruptor if it alters the function of endocrine system, thereby causing adverse effects on the organism. Toxicity testing approach. In order to identify an endocrine disruptor by toxicity testing, it has to show that an adverse effect would occur in vivo, in a test animal system or clinically. And also, it has to be demonstrated that the mechanism by which substance causing adverse effect is endocrine. That means there should be a plausible link between adverse effect and endocrine mechanism. Mechanisms can be detected in vitro, whereas adverse effects can be detected in vivo. So how do we establish this link between adverse effects and endocrine mechanisms? So there are two ways. One is top-down procedure and the other is bottom-up procedure. In the top-down procedure, based on positive findings obtained in vivo, we can investigate if the endocrine mechanisms are the cause of these effects using various in vitro mechanistic assays. In the bottom-up procedure, uh, we start with number of in vitro assays to address various mechanisms by which the endocrine system can be disturbed. After obtaining findings from these in vitro assays, they must be prioritized for testing in vivo. In vitro assays. We all know that endocrine system includes ovaries, testes, thyroid, pituitary glands, etc. These endocrine glands secrete hormones. So hormones produced by these endocrine glands travel through blood streams to specific receptors in target organs, where they can trigger their biological effects. Endocrine disruptors interfere with the endocrine system by various mechanisms. One of them is the direct interaction with the receptors responsible for hormone signaling, such as androgen receptor, estrogen receptor, thyroid receptor, etc. So what are androgen receptors? Androgen receptor is a type of nuclear receptor which is activated by binding any of the androgenic hormones like testosterone, etc. There are agonists and antagonists in these androgen receptors. So androgen agonists are the class of drugs that activate the androgen receptor. Androgen antagonists are the class of drugs that block the androgen receptor. Side effects include breast enlargements, infertility in men, and menstrual irregularities in women. Estrogen receptors. Estrogen receptors are the receptors that are activated by estrogen hormone. There are two classes of estrogen receptors, estrogen receptor alpha and estrogen receptor beta. Both of them are expressed in different tissue types. There are again estrogen receptor alpha agonist, antagonist, also estrogen receptor beta agonist and antagonist. Side effects include heart flashes, osteoporosis, depression, etc. Thyroid hormone receptors. Thyroid hormone receptor antagonists are those which inhibit binding of thyroid hormones to their receptors. Aryl hydrocarbon receptors. These are the these aryl hydrocarbon receptors function as sensor of xenobiotic chemicals and also 
the regulator of enzymes such as cytochrome P450 that metabolizes these chemicals. There are several guidelines already existing to identify various in vitro and in vivo mechanisms. As mentioned earlier, we need to identify the adverse effects and also which mechanism of endocrine is causing these adverse effects. We have guidelines for in vitro testing as well as for in vivo testing. Even if we are able to detect adverse effects using in vivo assays, we still need mechanistic assays to obtain information on mode of action of substance. Most of the time, mechanistic assays are conducted in vitro. So we'll be concentrating on in vitro assays in this session. Uh, we have several models in case ultra related to rat, human, and mammalian models. We also cover chemicals from collab collaborative estrogen receptor activity prediction project of EPA. Our models include androgen receptor agonist, antagonist, estrogen receptor alpha agonist, antagonist, estrogen receptor beta agonist, antagonist, thyroid receptor antagonist, and aryl hydrocarbon receptor agonist. So the training sets ranges from 1073 chemicals to 20,763 chemicals within human models, 1047 to 3,425 for animal models, 885 to 6,964 for mammalian model. Validations of case ultra. The external validations ranges from 61 to 91% sensitivity, 61 to 87% specificity and 0 0.66 to 0 0.89 ROC. Internal validations ranges from 63 to 94% sensitivity, 68 to 92% specificity, 0 0.86 to 0.96 AOC. These metrics indicate that the models are pretty good. Within our training sets, we cover most of the known endocrine disruptors. Some of the examples include Dietyl stilbestrol, bisphenol A, endosulfan, PCBs, DDTs, etc. Uh, the structures here indicates how the chemicals are represented within our case ultra interface. So for example, if we consider dietyl stilbestrol, the color, the color in red, dark red indicates main alert and light red indicates the sub alerts. For example, if we see the dietyl stilbestrol here, Alert 1 has 95 positives and 89 negatives. When we say 95 positive, it means that there are 95 compounds within the training set which indicates that this alert is positive. In the same way for alert 2, we have 30 compounds which are considering this alert as positive and 22 compounds which consider it as negative. So based on the probabilities of being positive from all these alerts, we can say that that particular compound is positive or negative. In the similar way, we can do the predictions for rest of the compounds. Human and animal models. So most of the time, clinical trials will be conducted on animals and then we'll be using those the tablets or whatever on human, right? So uh, what we did is out of curiosity, we tried to compare human and animal models of androgen antagonist. And we identified that there are majority of the compounds in which it is positive in androgen antagonist rat is also positive in androgen antagonist human, which shows that there is good comparison between the human and animal models. Experimental outcomes predicted by case ultra. We tried predicting various experimentally proven endocrine disruptors against our models to check how good the predictions are. As of now, we considered only human models due to the time constraint for explanation. We also have animal and mammalian models available. Considering an example of prochloras, if we can see prochloras, it has been proven that it is androgen antagonist, estrogen antagonist, and aryl hydrocarbon agonist. If we see the structures below, we already know from our training sets that it is androgen antagonist, and also estrogen antagonist. Also, our case ultra model has predicted it as positive in aryl hydrocarbon agonist. Uh, if we see the aryl hydrocarbon structure, 
we can see that there are 114 compounds considering that particular alert as positive and 49 compounds considering it as negative, which shows that it is, on, it is a strong alert and it is positive. The side effects caused by prochloras include mood swings, depression, weight gain, hot flushes, vaginal dryness, etc. Second example is raloxifene. It has estrogen agonistic effects as well as estrogen antagonistic effects. The estrogen agonistic effects are on bone and lipid metabolism. Estrogen antagonistic effects are on uterine endometrium and breast tissues. If we see the structures below here also, we already know from our training sets that it is an estrogen agonist as well as estrogen antagonist alpha and beta. From the predictions, we were able to identify that it is predicted as positive in estrogen agonist beta based on two alerts. One is the main alert with 60 positive compounds saying that the alert is positive and 47 compounds saying the alert as positive for the second alert. Similarly, for phenarimol, it was also it was also an experimentally proven estrogen agonist and androgen antagonist, which was successfully present within our case ultra models too. We already know from the training sets that it is estrogen agonist, and from the predictions, we were able to identify that it is an androgen antagonist. So from these examples, we can clearly see that the predictions are good. All the mechanisms related to a substance are either predicted accurately or are already present within our training sets, which shows that we are able to identify all the mechanisms for a specific compound. These models can be used as step towards identification of mode of action. Remember that we still need in vivo testing to make the process complete as we need to know what adverse effects are and also what mechanisms are causing these adverse effects. With this, I would like to conclude and thanks to everyone for your patience. Okay, everyone. Uh, I think we can probably go ahead and shift into Q&A. If you have any questions, I'll remind you to uh, go ahead and type any questions into the question panel, or I can also be monitoring for um, anyone who would like to be brought off mute to um, verbalize their question. I did get a few along the way throughout the presentation, so I can start there, and if any come up, I'll um, be keeping an eye out. So um, one of the questions that came in earlier in the presentation was uh, asking about how multi-case, uh, well, I guess specifically case ultra helps identify surrogates for a read across approach. So I'll pose that to either Suman, Rustam, Monica. <clears throat> Suman probably. Yeah, Suman. I mean, I can say yeah, um, I can. just, I was just gonna mention that you know, if you're interested in taking a closer look in Case Ultra, I know that there's a, a, quite a few people here who are already using Case Ultra. Um, but if you have not used Case Ultra and you're interested in getting a glimpse inside the program, please visit our website, uh, multicase.com backslash news. And I can put this in the chat as well. We'll be, um, we will be organizing a web demo in the next month, um, I believe at the end of March. So if you're interested in attending that, that will really give you a good idea of the capabilities of the program, but please go ahead, Suman. Yeah, so uh, in, in Case Ultra, you know, as a program, you can perform uh, surrogate, okay, search for surrogate chemicals in a variety of ways. And the first uh, and the most simple search is to, uh, to, to use the similarity of the whole chemical, query chemical, uh, and find out from the databases different chemicals uh, that have similarity with, with the query chemical. You know, so that is the basic search, um, and obviously every chemical that you'll get from the from the database would also contain uh, its uh, biological activity, experimental outcome, uh, and details about the experiment. The other more uh, directed and more uh, more uh, sophisticated searches are based on um, you know adding more criteria, like say for example. Uh, you want to search surrogate chemical that has that contain a particular alert. So in that case, that's also possible. Uh, you can find out chemicals that contain a specific alert 
and then you can search for it and you, you'll get similar compound, but only those similar compound that contain the same alert. Then you can also perform a subtractal search where you can take the query chemical and highlight a particular portion of the chemical and then search and you'll only get um, uh, chemical that contain that uh, particular um, uh, substructure and also those that are similar to your query chemical. So these are three different ways of may finding surrogate chemicals from uh, using uh, case ultra. Thank you. Thanks, Suman. Um, sure. I have someone with their hand raised, Dr. Ramana. Uh, okay. I see that you have your hand raised. I'm going to bring you off mute and give you an opportunity to verbalize your question. Dr. Ramana, can you hear me? Okay. Mm, I'll come back. Okay, so I'm going to move on. So um, just a simple clarification, more of a comment. Have I understood correctly that all multi-case models are built based upon substructural fragments and that these do not consider stereochemistry? Um, uh, yeah. Yeah, please finish your question. Yeah, and I was going to group that together with a, a another question about predicting genotoxicity of positional isomers and um, mm -hmm. whether or not that's possible, specifically mm -hmm. positional isomeric esters. So could you mm -hmm. comment on that, please? Yeah, sure. So a majority of our of our models, case ultra models, are built on using fragments, and they do not consider stereochemistry. Uh, in, in respect that it doesn't uh, differentiate between RS and R and S configuration and cis and trans. But positional isomers are covered. I mean, if you have two different positional isomers, then you'll get different results. So positional isomers can be differentiated. So, you know, as far as I understand, positional isomer, isomerism means that if you have, say, ortho position and meta position or para position, so those, that sort of positional isomers are differentiated. Uh, in regards to other types of descriptors, case ultra actually uses a lot of descriptors uh, in addition to fragment descriptors. And those descriptors include uh, physical chemical properties like log P, water solubility, vapor pressure, molecular refractivity, but uh, also use uh, uh, surface descriptors like polarizable surface areas, volume, uh, E-state descriptors, charge descriptors. So those descriptors are usually employed when we are trying to model a, an endpoint like LD50 or say aquatic toxicity. So uh, depending on the uh, endpoint, different types of descriptors are used, uh, but in vast majority of the cases, uh, fragment descriptors are the primary descriptor that we, we tend to use. Thank you. Okay. And in the same vein, someone's asking about um, how platinum is handled and is is the data curator tool useful to join organometallics? Yeah, yeah I can answer that. Yes, data curator tool has a built-in structure editor. So you actually can modify the original small code for organometallics or for platinum complexes, which are usually provided as a bunch of pieces, platinum is separately, whatever ligands in there are also separately, so you can join them. And what that's what we actually do. We join them by covalent bonding. If you like some other editors, ChemDraw, IcedRaw, you actually can do these uh, manipulations over there and copy and paste into data curator. That's fairly easy. But that's how we handle it. We actually kind of violate um, chemical rules in a way. We join metals within uh, organometallics with their ligands by covalent bonds. Unfortunately, there is no other way to do it because small, current at least small notation does not support coordination compounds. So there is absolutely no way to have a proper small code which would represent this particular type of bond. So we forced to do covalent bonding. If you will do the same, you will be right within the domain of applicability for this kind of compounds with case ultra models. Thank you. Okay, thanks, Rustum. Um, I have another question about, um, I'm sorry, hold on a second. 
Oh, okay. So uh, someone was wondering what distinguishes free models from commercially available models and what are the limitations of the models? I know, Simon, you touched on that a bit, but if you could mm -hmm. just elaborate a little bit more. Yeah, sure. So first, uh, limitations of our models. So every model has limitations. And, uh, you know, one of the major limitations that I see from a technical point of view is the applicability domain. So since every model's model is built with a certain uh, group of chemicals as training set, uh, so they, they obviously cannot uh, be used for testing things or chemicals that are very different from the training set. So that's one of the, um, one of the limitations of model. And the other limitation is uh, depending on the size of the training set. So if, you, if we have a model that are small um, in terms of the number of training set chemicals that has been used to build this model, say, you know, 500 chemicals or 600 chemicals, that model's accurate, prediction accuracy will obviously be lower as compared to models that has been built with 20,000 chemicals. So that's, that's also a limitation, the accu prediction accuracy. Um, the the uh, other limitation that I can uh, I would um, add is that we are better at predicting um, uh, chemical classes that are binary in nature, so active, inactive, positive, negatives. Uh, in terms of uh, uh, predicting quantitative values, uh, you know we can we can do a lot, but it actually uh, depends on particular endpoint in question. So we are much better in predicting uh, positive and negative kind of binary class uh, predictions. You know, so these are three limitations that I can think of regarding the question about free and uh, paid models. Sure, there are lots of free uh, models available. And uh, um, the important distinction is that when you use our models, uh, these are obviously paid models and you need to um, you know, these are commercial models. So the biggest advantage is that these models are of high quality. You know, the data is of high quality. Data has been curated uh, very carefully over the years. And uh, we, have, we have maintained these databases. So maintenance of commercial models is of important concern. You know, something that is free, usually what we have seen in our experience that they have been developed once and for years they have not been developed or maintained properly. So that's another thing. The third thing is customer support, you know, just getting a model and getting a program, sometimes it's not enough. You will eventually need some sort of uh, help uh, when you run into some problems or issues, you know, it can come up. It will be fantastic if we don't have any problems. Uh, majority of our customers don't have, but sometimes you, you need help. And commercial uh, companies like ours, are good at providing, you know, customer support, technical support, etc. So I, I think these are important uh, distinction between free and, um, uh, you know, paid models. Another thing that uh, Rusam mentioned during other, one one other uh, uh, webinar is that the the support or the acceptability by the regulatory agencies. So uh, if the regulatory agencies come across free models that are of no, not high quality, they are not usually very receptive towards free models. You know, So I think that's another very, very important uh, distinction between commercial models and uh, uh, free models. Okay, Someone yes. else would actually to add to it. If you want just to play around, if you want to do some kind of very preliminary research, whatever, you can use pretty much whatever it is whatever you have. You can use free models, you can use commercial models, etc. But if you're trying to support your regulatory submission with some kind of in silico approach, then you need to consider if this in silico approach will be recognized by regulators. And that's where commercial models have a priority over free models. Though in Europe, QSAR toolbox seems to be popular, but again, it's um, usability and uh, ease to use sometimes raise the questions. Thanks, Rustam. Oh, uh, so circling back to fragment search, someone's asking, you know, how do you do a fragment search? And is there some sort of recommended criteria for considering similarity? Um, okay, so fragment search can be done in a variety of ways. Uh, you know, 
so fragments are essentially uh, subtractors. So you know you can take a particular fragment and search uh, through the list of uh, training set chemicals and find out which chemicals contain them. So that's one of the things that I I usually use myself um, to perform uh, fragment search. Uh, second second part of the question is uh, what uh, Diana I forgot. What is the criteria for similarity? Considering similarity okay. between yeah yeah. So uh, the, if I if I understand your question correctly, um, criteria is actually nothing fixed. You know, depending on on the chemical that you are trying to uh, search for, and depending on the question that we try to answer for. So so if you are trying to just make a similarity search and you are performing an overall structural similarity, then you uh, would would probably need higher similarity values like you know above 0 0.7 or 0 0.8. Uh, but if you are searching for analogs that contain a particular alert uh, and you are only interested in getting chemicals that contain the same alert, then you can actually go down in the similar values because then you are not uh, too much concerned about the whole structural similarity, but only this similarity around the structural environment around the alert, you know. So, and and then you have to make a visual um, analysis of the analog that you obtain, if the if they make sense or not. So basically, what I think is that similarity search is just to get is an excuse to get the best possible analogs, but there is no specific criteria about like a, a threshold of similarity value that you can use. Sometimes values like 0.7 may be very well, but sometimes you can actually uh, compromise with lower values depending on the uh, chemical at hand. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Yeah, I think we'll probably circle back to that with the next question, but just to okay. summarize another fragment question, uh, someone wants to know if there's a way to include their own fragments. So could you elaborate on that too? Uh, not really. In <laughs> our program so far, <laughs> so far you cannot include your own fragments, though, although you can include your own chemicals. So that will that will ultimately contribute your fragments to our fragments you know in combine them so there is a way to include uh, your own chemicals to our models there is a very straightforward way that is the only way i can i can see that how you can include your own fragments okay um, someone's asking about, you know, combining the informations and results that you get from different models. So if you're getting different mm -hmm. results about the same compound, how do you take a consensus to reach a ultimate conclusion? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a good question. That that totally depends on the endpoint that you are concerned with and uh, the, maybe the we type can of... Use, I was going to say maybe we could use um, the... ED models as an example. Yeah. So so basically, uh, whenever whenever you are trying to combine the outcome of different models, I think the first step is to look into the alerts. You know what kind of alerts are obtained, not the final call. You know. So suppose all the calls are negative. Uh, if you are using five models and all the calls are negative. Even then, it's important to go inside the prediction and see if any alerts are recognized, you know. And suppose you see that all the five chem, uh, models are identified, identified the same alert, then actually there is something going on over there, you know. And mm -hmm. and uh, if you see variety of different alerts that come up with uh, different uh, prediction, different model prediction, then there is no consensus. So sometimes. We, I, I remember that we used to use a very elaborate uh, technology a uh, long time ago uh, with US FDA. And there we used to check out what are, what are the reasons of uh, alert that are coming out from carcinogenicity models, you know? So when the reasons of prediction agree with each other, that's a much stronger uh, reason to combine the final calls instead of if, if every model recognize completely different uh, 
reasons of underlying activity. So it depends on the system, you know. Um, and also, uh, sometimes we check for every alert, what are the similar compounds. So it, it's a completely, uh, it's a activity that depends on the system, you know. <clears throat> Okay, so thank you. For example, show a clear case when uh, I don't remember which was a case study, but uh, it clearly shows exactly the same fragment was responsible for positive finding in in androgen models, in estrogen models, I believe, yeah. in child models as well. So yeah. that's usually a clear sign that there is a problem with this chemical. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, so since yeah, we're on so the... just one, oh, one, one little ad addition, you know, so. Uh, the the agreement of the reasoning of the prediction is much stronger uh, stronger case as compared to agreement of the final call oh, okay go ahead jen mm -hmm. um someone wanted to know if any data from pesticides were included in in the ed database yes okay yes it is included and where can they find that information uh, within all of our models, we provided the references, including the links from where we got the data. So they can check over there. Yes. Okay. Okay, great. So it's um, it's a couple minutes after 11. So for the sake of everyone's time, I'm going to finish up. Um, there's only a few more questions. So um, someone's wondering when the GT3 MNT model will be considered for an update. So that's related to our genotoxicity package. Um, well, it is in our far-fetched plans. I cannot say that it's going to be done tomorrow. Most likely yeah. it's going to be done this year because we, one of our RCA partners actually wanted to supply us additional bunch of data and a lot of this data will contribute to that model. So I'm uh, optimistic if that will happen, we're going to update this gen toxicity package, not only MNT, but also Chrome Apps and probably mostly inform models this year. Okay, thanks. Okay, if there are any follow-up questions to this session, please feel free to reach out to any of us uh, on the multi-case team. You can reach me, um, Gianna and multi-case, or just simply info at multi-case. And uh, I think with that, we can probably conclude the session. Um, I'd just like to ask everyone to please provide some feedback about the session with a quick survey when you leave today. Um, we're always interested to know which topics you're interested in exploring together with us. And so that would really help us for future discussions. So with that, thanks again, everyone, for your attention and time today. And hopefully you found the information presented uh, useful to your work. And please do follow up with any additional questions anytime. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Take care. Bye-bye.